then also some, oh, I'm recording, okay. So, um, so some of the vineyard uh, can be spray basics and also some of the calibration strategies that um, have been kind of developed through um, some of the people who work through WSU. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe next, there we go. So Charlotte, um, you know, she did a great job introducing me. Thank you so much. And I, I am um, an avid gardener. I really like to play on my tractor. I also really love research, but I think that the best way to learn is definitely with a smile on your face. And that's why I love to talk about sprayers because sprayers, they make me happy. So that's also my Malbec there with the um, uh, Mount Adams in the background. So it's not a terrible place to live, but I bet you guys have bigger mountains and better views than I do. So let's talk about sprayers. Now sprayers and other plant protection equipment, they've been around for centuries, but we really kind of tend to focus on the plant or the pest or the disease instead of the equipment itself. So by having the appropriate tool for that job and it's then properly maintained and calibrated, it can make the difference between control and failure of that particular applied product. So I just wanna start with some of these technologies. And if you have a question, as Charlotte said, at any point, or you want clarification on a specific type, please go ahead and let me know or let Charlotte know in that chat box. <clears throat> so, as you saw in those old pictures, sprayers have continued to evolve to what we have today. So we have lots of engineering feats that we you know, or challenges that we've overcome and we kind of have widened our breadth of knowledge when it comes to the technology. But now that we have all these options, how do you choose a sprayer for today's more modern horticultural um, practices and the management that you're doing? Does the type of sprayer you have really make a difference? Aren't they all just kind of doing the same job? Um, and why does your sprayer really need to be calibrated when, it, when you're doing an application? I mean, if it's running, isn't that really what it needs to do? What, what more do you need, right? <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about um, some of these um, sprayers that I've worked with in, in my PhD and with growers around Eastern Washington specifically. And some of them you may have seen, some of them you may not have seen. So I'm just gonna start off with the workhorse, the one that pretty much everybody knows, but it's also the oldest technology that we still utilize. And that's the Rears um, air blast sprayer or just an air blast sprayer in general. So again, this one's kind of considered the, the standard um, just because it's been here the longest. So this is our, our axial fan, kind of our air blast setup here. <clears throat> and it's a single axial fan. So you can see that there's just one fan here and then this would be where the nozzle bodies are. Um, I'll have a different picture so you can see where those are actually located in relation to the fan itself. And these particular nozzles here, they can be exchanged or they're interchangeable um, nozzles. So we have, so I'm sorry. So these are what we would call um, a disc core nozzle. So you can see that they're kind of flat to that nozzle body. Whereas this is kind of where the industry has moved to here in Washington <laughs> and probably around the country. Um, these are kind of a single body nozzle and they are the same type of technology, but they're in a, a single body instead of that two pieces that are the disc core. And I'm actually gonna show you those pictures a little later so you can understand them. But I just wanted to kind of start off here so that we could work towards that. So. We've already seen one uh, step up in technology. So we've gone from these, these nozzles here to these nozzles here, but really other than that, there hasn't been a whole lot of updating to this particular technology. We do have deflectors. Um, they help to adjust kind of where the air is going. And sometimes I've even seen this uh, particular um, sprayer was used in a hop yard, but I have seen where growers will reduce the amount of air or the amount of suction that's coming into the, the machine. So it can reduce the amount of air being put out. So it kind of um, regulates how, how deep it penetrates into the canopy itself. So we'll, we'll talk about this, this particular um, kind of technology, or excuse me, strategy um, at, when we get to calibration, okay? <laughs> so an air blast sprayer is, is a single row. So it's two, 
unopposed half rows, one on either side. Again, it's an axial fan. You can exchange those nozzles. And here you can see this is where that nozzle body, um, that nozzles are housed. And then right behind here is where the fan would be. So you've got all of that air coming in and it's being pushed out through the nozzle. So it comes in the back and out through the side um, when it hits that wall with the nozzles itself. And you can have air and you can also turn your air off. And that's something else I'll bring up because as, as um, uh, well, as we've noticed, the sprayer that we use most often, this one, or that we have used most often, was actually developed for large trees. And grapes are not large trees. So the amount of air that comes out of this sprayer is probably not appropriate for your canopy. So, which is why I'm gonna bring up the with and without air a little bit later on and kind of show you how or why that might be beneficial for your practices. But before I go further, I do wanna to, um, touch back on the nozzles. So these are a disc core nozzle here. So um, that flat body to the, the nozzle, or excuse me, that flat nozzle to the, to the nozzle body itself. This is what was inside of it. It's two pieces. It can be a real pain because you go to put them in, you put them in upside down and then you don't spray correctly or you drop one and you lose it forever because it's tiny. Um, but it, this, this is kind of where we've started and it's, um, it's a good technology, but we have improved on it. So we've moved to this, this is that single body. So inside of this single body here, you actually have the disc and the core, excuse me. And, and you're able to see them better. They're larger, you can hold them in your hand more easily, but they're also color coded. So you can walk up to your sprayer, see your nozzle and know what's in the, in, the, in the sprayer itself because you know what color it is. So that's another way um, that we've kind of improved on that in a, in a kind of low key type of manner. The next big improvement, and I'm not gonna talk about this a whole lot, but if you have experience with a weed sprayer, you might've come in contact with this um, more readily than in a canopy sprayer. So this is the same kind of shape or form as the previous nozzle. So it's considered still a one body piece. However, if you'll notice here at this bottom, um, there's a seam and you can actually lift the top piece um, off, this top piece off, off of the bottom. And inside you'll actually physically see the core. It's typically ceramic. Um, and, it's, and it's so that, um, when the air comes through this little, this little hole right here at the bottom, it creates a venturi and it introduces air inside of water droplets. So you get kind of um, a Swiss cheese effect instead of a solid droplet. So when it hits something, it shatters and it kind of splatters at the same time, which is why we, see, we tend to see this a lot more in canopy, excuse me, in weed sprayers than canopy sprayers. But it is something that could be useful in a canopy sprayer if you have, say, um, a really windy site or um, you're using it to kind of control your drift. So that's another option. Okay, I will, I will talk more about nozzles later because I am a nozzle head, so that is my deal. Um, but I'm gonna move on to the next type of sprayer or sprayer technology. <laughs> and this is a pneumatic sprayer. So this octopus looking thing right here, this is a Greg wire sprayer. This just happens to be the brand, but it's also an over the row sprayer. So you can see how when you go down the row, it actually sprays more than one row at a time. So here with this first sprayer, you're doing two half rows. So one single row. Whereas with this sprayer, you're spraying one full row, two full rows and one, two half rows. So this is a three row sprayer. And the way the nozzle works, so this is a pneumatic nozzle, the way this works, it's, it's an air shear nozzle. So you have water that comes in and then those, the, sorry, that water is then sh sheared by the air or it's the, the water stream is then sh sheared by the air as it comes through the nozzle itself. And then that in, in and of itself actually creates the droplets. So this is also, um, the fan speed on this, on this type of sprayer is also really important because it depend, that helps dictate how big your droplets are. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if, you, if you're interested in this type of sprayer, 
you're going to need to keep your RPMs up high enough. That way you can actually shear the water so you can get physical droplets. Otherwise it just comes out of slobber and you never actually make it to the canopy, which is also unuseful. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of detail about each of these sprayers as we go along. And again, they might not particularly pertain to um, what you guys see, but I just, again, I kind of want to get it in your, into your knowledge base that there are lots of options out there. So you can see here, each of these, uh, we call them wind socks because it's a wind, it's essentially the same fabric as a wind sock. It has five nozzles on it, one, two, three, four, five. And you can change it so that certain nozzles are open maybe earlier in the season um, as opposed to later in the season, um, but they're not all going to have equal output as you would see in an interchangeable nozzle because the system is self-regulating. So um, in, a, in, an, in an interchangeable nozzle, the kind that we saw in the air blast sprayer, you know what the um, GPM is gonna be out of each of those nozzles at a particular pressure. You do not know that on a pneumatic sprayer. So some people don't like that, but it is, it's just, um, it's, not a, uh, it's not a bad characteristic, but it can be a challenge if you're unsure about this particular technology. So again, you can change the, the nozzle, excuse me, you can change which nozzles uh, water comes out of or spray comes out of during different times of the season. So if you have a smaller canopy, you can down, down the number of nozzles that are open. You can raise them when the, when the, spray, um, when the canopy gets bigger. Um, there's a lot of things that go into each of these sprayers and, and it's just a, it's a lot of learning your particular sprayer and I'm gonna get to, into that later on too. And I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, Charlotte, does anybody, do you know of anybody who has a, a rate controller in your group? I would not count on a lot of people having rate controllers. Okay. Do you want me to cover them? Let's save that for another day. Perfect, great. I'm gonna bypass that one, okay, next. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <clears throat> so the next um, kind of upgrade in technology comes with this multi-axial fan. So axial fan sprayers, they're pretty rugged. They're pretty bulletproof um, comparatively. And to take that and uh, to take that technology and then make it multiple small fans is actually pretty genius. So this one, uh, this is a uh, yeah, quantum mist. Sorry, this is a quantum mist sprayer. And just like this Greg wire sprayer here, it also is over the row. So you've got one full row, two full row, and, and then two half rows. So this is again, a three row sprayer. But instead of having this solid uh, wind sock, these are actually tiltable fan heads. So you get the same kind of pattern of air coming out of it <clears throat> as you would with an axial fan. So you have that rotational piece and there are really good ways to combat that um, with the type of nozzle placement on it and um, how fast the fans go themselves. So again, um, a multi-row over the row. There are six nozzles. Uh, I think on the small fan heads, there's six and on the big ones, there's eight. So it kind of depends on the model you have or how big your canopy is, you can you can actually interchange those or retrofit your sprayer to make it more usable for your particular location. And those arms do come in and out. I don't think I have any videos of those, but the, the arms of the sprayer actually fold up to it so that way you can drive normally and you're not gonna hit anything. And then they actually have hydraulics that, that pull them all out. And that's the same for the Greg wire also. <clears throat> so, um, again, like I said, with the placement, this is a really key piece to it because when we talk about um, axial fans, there's, a, there's that pattern of air that comes out of it until there's a swirl. And we have the same issue when we, when we talk about air blasts because as the fan rotates, there is a change in air as it comes out. So one side's gonna be high and one side's gonna be low. And so, to combat that, um, there's the, the air straightener that I showed you at the top of the, of the air blast sprayer, 
But when you have smaller fans like this, it's actually better just to have them in a symmetrical pattern. So that square pattern there actually helps you not have a band. So with this lower pattern here, you actually create a band where you're missing this top component of as it swirls, you're actually not getting um, good deposition onto your canopy because it's just not um, uh, situated correctly to come out. <clears throat> so that's kind of all of those all together. And then this last one I want to talk about is the electrostatic. This particular um, model brand, this is an on target. There are lots of electrostatics you can come across, um, lecto blasts. I have drawn a whole bunch of blanks, but they are, um, they're really interesting because this electrostatic is the same type of nozzle. This nozzle here is similar to this other pneumatic. So these are both pneumatic nozzles. But with the electrostatic, as in the name, it is actually charged. There's electricity involved in it. So the air comes through this piping here. And then there are water lines that come up to the nozzle itself. And just like the other pneumatic, you put water into the, the path of an air and it shears it. And in doing that, inside of that nozzle, inside here, there's an electrode and it actually charges that water as it comes in contact and when it when it sprays into droplets, those droplets then have a really um, mild or light charge around them, but it's enough that um, it's, it actually holds the charge so that way when it gets to the, the canopy in theory, it actually helps surround the item itself. This is the same type of technology that we see in like paint booths and things of that nature so that it actually helps to um, quote wrap around. <clears throat> this one is also an over-the-row sprayer. I think most of these uh, over-the-row, the, the three that I've shown you, can all be single-row sprayers. Um, but in our in, in our region, the industry tends to use a lot of over-the-row sprayers just because we have a lot of acreage that they're trying to get through. <clears throat> um, this pneumatic sprayers in general have tend to have really low volume gallon per acre. And this one especially, so if you go anything over like 20 gallon per acre, it doesn't work. Just the, the charge won't hold. You get really undefined droplets. You kind of get into that slobber piece. So it's on either end of the spectrum. You don't have enough air, um, you get slobber. And if you have too much water, you, you get slobber. So it's you gotta find that sweet spot in the middle where air and water kind of give you the right or the um, desired droplets or droplet size that you want. <clears throat> a real key thing that you won't come in contact with with any other type of sprayer, if you have an electrostatic, you have to check the voltage. Um, if you don't have voltage at your nozzle tips, then you don't have an electrostatic sprayer. It's just a really fancy, um, expensive pneumatic sprayer. So that's a, that's a key thing that you have to keep in mind if you choose to go with something like this. So now that I've shown you four very different sprayers. Um, there's a lot going on when we talk about sprayers. And it, I, I love them because again, they're kind of this choose your own adventure and you can pick what's good for your location. You can pick what's right for you financially. You can um, pick something that you can then alter. So like if you have an air blast sprayer and you have a windy site and you have drift issues, you can put in different nozzles. So like there are so many factors that go into choosing a sprayer that I think it's it's really important to know kind of what your options are because not everybody's going to need or want the same thing. So when you're thinking about this, you know, you have to keep all of these things in in your mind as you consider them. But of course, when you make a decision, and you end up doing actual applications, this is, this is where the next piece comes into. Now you've chosen a sprayer, what's the next piece? Well, you have to calibrate it because just like this person here, here, here this gentleman is spraying these, um, these are apples. This is outside the research station here in, in uh, Washington. And he's not actually really hitting anything. 
especially on this side. The wind is so stiff that he's losing all of this money. It's just going up into the air or it's drifting onto this house. There, there could be people around. The amount of waste that's happening in this is just is incredible. And I, as a small farmer, know that I don't like to waste money. So this is this is why not only safety wise but why it's important for you to be knowledgeable of your sprayer so that you can calibrate it to the best um to the best of your abilities and to the best of like your canopy itself because that's important so i'm going to go over these um best management kind of practices for calibration these, I think it's six, these six steps, um, they were kind of defined by Gwen Ho Heisel. She's our area extension educator at WSU. And I think she has this published. So if you're interested in it, it's a really simple document. It's got all the math that I'm about to show you. It's not hard math, but it does have math, excuse me, in it. Um, so I can get that to Charlotte if you're interested. But I always say that the best management practice for your sprayer is just to take care of it, you know, as uh, you know, I'm I'm a Crosby Stills Nash fan, and as Stills will say, um, you know, love the one you're with. So, love the sprayer you have, and just understand it, and try to take care of it as best as you can, because that again is is this is your first line of defense in controlling something, um, any type of pest or disease. So, it's good to know your best management practices so that you can actually. Um, succeed. So again, different types of technology. We've got the over the row, some of these alternative ones, um, which include the pneumatics or the electrostatics. I didn't really touch on this one because it's not typically one that I would see in uh, vineyards here, um, unless you are a uh, tree fruit grower and a grape grower. A lot of times they will actually have these, uh, we call them tower sprayers, so that you can get air into places that are higher, mostly for trees, but you can use these. So this is a directed air um, comparative to this air blast, which is just kind of a willy nilly out the side, <clears throat> but this is the same technology. So the first thing you have to do to calibrate your sprayer is to check the speed. So you're actually checking your speed of your tractor with the intended um, PTO. RPM, um, you should have your tank full to the level of which you would spray normally. That way your tractor is pulling the same weight. And you should also make sure that you're doing this particular speed check in the same type of terrain as you would when you um, apply. So like, don't do it with an empty tank on a, a gravel parking lot or a paved parking lot if you have one. When you're really going to, you know, be, you have a full tank, and you're going to be in the vineyard and it's kind of wobbly and bumpy and things like that. So the first piece you should always um, to do is check your speed. This this doesn't really pertain to you guys, but it's just something to keep in mind. If anybody ever gets a rate controller, rate controllers are really useful because they're an in-cab computer that says, your sprayer is doing this, or this is how fast you're going. This is your GPA. A lot of times it's incorrect which is kind of counterintuitive to the tool, but it is what it is. So it's really good to manually check your speed. You can also use um, GPS and other kind of apps and things to, along with that, but it's, it's not very hard, you know, twice a season, you go out and set hundred feet and you just time yourself as you go between, no big deal. So the second piece is then to adjust that air. So now you know your speed, now you're gonna pull your sprayer into the, the actual vineyard and your, or trees or whatever you choose to spray. Um, you're gonna pull it in and you're actually going to manually adjust your sprayer to, to direct the air into the section that you want. That is, if you have a sprayer that you can adjust the air with. So this is a quantum mist. We've got lots of spray heads and they're all pointed into that canopy. So you're wanting to kind of give that opposing force so the way when when they come in contact, when the air comes in contact, the opposing air forces, they actually stay in the canopy. So they kind of stop 
and they stay in your canopy instead of like missing each other and then going through the canopy itself. Again, kind of defeats the purpose if what you're spraying doesn't stay where you want it to. So along with drift, we're also trying to counter, counter missing the canopy. Okay. Um, I think, yeah. So this one, another way or a good way for you to kind of check your air um, or to, to, to check how to adjust your air is to use flagging tape. Which, which is really easy to do. Um, you just tie it to the fan or to the nozzle body if it's a pneumatic or something of that nature. So the way your, your flagging tape kind of comes into the airflow of where your sprayer is spraying. So with this particular air blast sprayer, I, well, I think there's 10 nozzles on each side. I think that's right. So obviously there's no real purpose to spray out of these nozzles up here. There is no canopy up here, not a single piece. But when you look at these on the side here, I think I have one, two, three, four, five, five pieces of flagging tape. So I'm, my tractor is stationary. I'm off of it. It's running. It's full. Um, I've done my speed test, all of those things. And I've just pulled it in. I've tied my tape on and I've, I'm running. I'm running this this um, sprayer now, and I want to see how or where that air is going because where your air is going is where your your droplets are going to go. So if your air is going way above your canopy and you have that nozzle open, you're not doing anything. You're not getting into your fruiting zone. You're not doing. You're not touching the top of this canopy up here. So this is imp this is an important step. I'd say this is by far. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot here. I think this is the second most important thing besides changing your nozzles is to actually make sure your air is going, it could be the first. Anyway, so when, when you're matching your air and your speed, like it's really important to make sure because you want that air to go into your canopy. Otherwise you're just, you're doing nothing, which is not very helpful. Okay. So that's step three. <clears throat> so the next piece, which is kind of the more math heavy component to it, is to actually calculate and record what you're getting from your nozzles. So I don't know how many people calibrate their sprayer in this group every year, or if anybody or everybody changes their nozzles, but that's a really simple way to save hundreds of dollars. I know it sounds counterintuitive, spend money, save money. But my dad always says the way you the way you make money is how you spend money. So I see this as a really simple investment because we spray some really abrasive things sometimes in, in vineyards. And so if you're multiple years in, let's say, let's say we're five years into the same nozzle, that nozzle is no longer doing its job because it's not putting out what you've told it to. You've probably never measured the output um, so you're not really sure. You just know that you fill the tank at this point and it sprays this many acres or this many rows, which uh, can work. But if you're worried about, um, oh, I'll, I'll forget what this is called. Uh, Charlotte, what, fungicide resistance. There you go. If you're worried about fungicide resistance and things like that, like you're you're going to need to know all of these things. That way, you are taking into account how much you're actually putting out. Because if you're over applying or under applying, then then you, you, that's not good. That's also not good. So, in order to do that, you can calculate it using this information here. There's also an app to do that, it's very handy. Vintech is a local um, uh, sprayer shop, sprayer manufacturer. They work kind of exclusively with Quantum Mist, um, but they do service lots of other things. So this is a really, really handy app. It does um, GPA to GPM. You can look at different nozzles that'll help you calculate like um, what nozzles you should use or uh, yeah, what nozzles you should use if you if you know your GPA that you want to put out. It also helps with calculating your miles per hour. So this is kind of an all-inclusive, very useful app you can have on your phone. So how do you actually measure that though? So 
and you need to calculate it, right? So this step, calculate it and record it. Great, I've done that, but how do I know? So this is uh, two, these are two types of sprayers here. So I've got a pneumatic sprayer here. This is a device that we actually, some it's PVC pipe. I mean, it's not rocket science. So we just stick it on the nozzle. And then at the base there, you can see where the water comes out. I have this tool and this gentleman over here has the same tool. This is a, it's a spot on is the brand, but it's just a flow calculator. So it'll actually measure how much your GPM is. Once it's, once the water hits it, it auto calculates it. So it'll tell you. So it's a really handy tool. Um, I can't remember how much it is, but it's something that, you know, one of those things where if you, you spend money to make money, this will really help you because you may be able to get two years out of your nozzles um, if you can tell how much the, the, the um, variation is between them. And these are all, again, this is all, um, this is an air blast sprayer, but these are all connected with, I think these are the, the fancy ones, but you can buy milk, uh, I think they're like milking attachments and you can actually fit them on top of your um, nozzle. I don't know if Gwen's going to come out, but if she comes out, she has all these fun tools in her toolbox, but um, you can fit them over there and then it just, you just have a piece of hose and you can just measure how much each nozzle is putting out. Again, if you only have five open on, on either side, then you, you only need to do this with 10 nozzles, which is a really simple, simple measurement. It'll take you, this whole process should probably take you a total of two hours, if that, which includes changing out your nozzles. So measure your actual output, also important. The last and final thing you need to do is actually verify your coverage or your deposition. So I don't know if anybody uses water sensitive paper, but that's what WSP is here. This is water sensitive paper and water sensitive paper is yellow. So this, this would be without any water on it. <clears throat> and it turns blue when it comes in contact with a liquid um, or an oil. So it's important to not uh, put your fingers on these because you'll get fingerprints all over them, but it's something you can put in your canopy. You can attach it with a staple. Uh, you can attach it with a clip. A lot of times we just staple them directly to leaves. You drive your sprayer down, you've already done all the other steps ahead of time, and you actually see where in your canopy your water is going, which is where your chemicals are going. I would suggest you do this with only water, no chemicals in your tank because that's not safe. So if you can just do that test run with that full tank when you're doing, um, after you've done your um, speed, speed test, this is, a, this is really interesting because you can actually see where it's going, know how to adjust it, and then understand why certain pieces are missing or why you're always getting, you have certain problem areas. The, the interesting part about this one is, is that this is the appropriate coverage, which is I think a 10 to 15%. If I remember correctly, let me see if it's in here. 10, yeah, 10 to 15%. This is the sufficient level of deposition for most foliar insecticides and, and fungicides, excuse me, <clears throat> this. These are oversprayed, which is interesting because a lot of people feel more comfortable with this oversprayed card. They're like, yeah, I got it, I did. But you're really not using your time or your chemicals wisely because you're over applying. So we're shooting for, you know, something like this, something like this. But this is, it's really simple. I mean, six steps. It's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. I am going to talk about air blast sprayers a little bit more because I think this is probably what a lot of you have. You might have pack blasts, kind of the smaller three point hitch ones. Um, I think, I think you guys mostly have maybe somewhere between one and five acres, if I remember correctly, as an average for your vineyard sizes. So We'll go from there. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's a lot of pack blasts and a lot of um, pull tanks because we have a lot of going okay, between okay. grapes and uh, peaches. 
of all things. Oh, peaches. Love it. Oh, that sounds great. Apples and peaches. Or sorry, grapes and peaches. Okay. So, all right. That's good to know. So I'm going to talk about these, uh, we call them VisiFlow. This, these are made by T-Jet. <clears throat> this is that nozzle again. So this is the regular nozzle, regular, regular one piece nozzle, and it produces this hollow cone. This is a hollow cone pattern. They do have full cone patterns, but hollow cone is the more um, readily used cone or, or shape pattern in our industry. This is the air induction nozzle. And then you can see between these two pictures, this one looks very soft on the edges and it's kind of like, just kind of um, not as abrupt. Whereas when you look at this one, you can kind of see that shattering effect where it hits the ground and it's very aggressive. And that's, that's what this is. That's that air induction nozzle where you have, instead of a solid droplet like you have here, you have a bigger droplet um, with the air induction nozzle because it's full of, of air bubbles. So you get a little bit more drag um, and it's just a bigger, not, uh, excuse me, a bigger, uh, not bubble, droplet comparative to this, this solid piece over here. So this will be like fine, very fine. Um, and these would be like, coarse, very coarse. And there's even ultra coarse, but it, um, I, we, you don't normally get into that with um, vineyard sprayers, excuse me, canopy sprayers. But I'm just gonna focus on this one here because this is kind of what, um, what would be the typical you would come across. <clears throat> so I have talked a lot about nozzles, but I haven't really talked about air. And air is really, hard to visualize if you haven't spent a lot of time on a sprayer or you're not quite sure about droplets. So these are the same nozzles. Oh, yep. Okay, so these are the same exact nozzles in between these two, right? This is with my air on. So I am just shattering this canopy. It is ruffled. It's going everywhere. I've got I've got what I've got droplets on either side of the canopy. The the next row over is also moving, but I'm not spraying that row. So that's not very helpful. So these these droplets aren't staying in my canopy. They're just they're just passing right through it. Whereas when you turn your air off, you can see I'm just just ruffling this inside section of the canopy where I am actually driving. And I do want my my application. Now, granted, there is drift here, but it's not nearly as aggressive as what's happening here. My next row over is not moving. It's just not moving. So when you have a smaller canopy, it's good to go through that calibration piece and make sure you're not just blowing through your canopy. And maybe it's okay for you to turn your nozzles off earlier in the season when you have a smaller canopy, as opposed to maybe later in the season when you have a larger canopy or a more dense canopy and you really need to get into it. I swear I'm almost done, hold on. Okay, so this, um, I have two timings here. So I have rachis elongation and then I also have fruit set. So this is that, this is what you've just seen here. These two um, side by side, so air on or air off. <clears throat> And it's the air blast sprayer, and that's that that hollow, excuse me, that single nozzle, one piece nozzle, and it's those smaller droplets. So visually, I can show you the video, but sometimes people understand it a little bit better if you can physically see like where the droplets are going. So that's what I have here. So inside the canopy, this is what the water sensitive paper showed me. Now, mind you, I went. I think I only went down one side. So I only sprayed one side of the canopy. <clears throat> so this is, you know, probably not the side I sprayed and this is the side I sprayed. So keep that in mind. This is only me spraying a half row also. And then here we have drift, one row over, two rows over and three rows over and then increments above the canopy. So in that first row of drift, it's it's everywhere. It's so high, it's it's all over the place. There's even drift three rows over. Now, when you come down here and you see that the fan is off in that early season, granted, this is this is still pretty, it's still pretty, um, there's, there's a lot of deposition on this, 
but there isn't anything over here on the floor, in the floor drift or in the aerial drift. Because guess what? We really just wanna spray the canopy. So even though it's over applied here, this is interesting because we wanna make sure that it's actually staying in the canopy. So air off looks like it worked best in this early season with the rachis elongation. Next, there we go. And then when it comes to fruit set, so you know I've got a little bit bigger canopy, I'm still having lots of extra deposition up here. This one's still, this is the, the air on, I've got too much deposition. This one's still pretty heavy also. You've got the same kind of thing going on though. Even with the larger canopy, there's probably less drift, but you still have no drift here. So make sure you're thinking about that because we're spraying vines and not trees. So if you have an air blast sprayer designed for trees, make sure that you're thinking about it and making it work for your vines. Okay, so I just want to close this one out. So get to know your sprayer, make sure you maintain it, you service it. Minimum, you should annually calibrate your sprayer. At the same time, you should probably change out your nozzles. Um, but it's really good to change your, or to check, recheck your calibration when you change your GPA. So as your canopy grows and you're changing your GPA, you're upping it, you wanna make sure that it's still doing its job. Um, you got lots of options to choose from in sprayers, kind of choose your own adventure. There are so many good references. If you have questions about nozzles, um, calibration, generally, just generally sprayers. And one of my favorite ones is actually Sprayers 101. And it's a really great, like easy to digest and understand resource for growers. Um, there's lots of videos, lots of information, lots of handouts. There's a great book. So I really suggest if you have questions or you're unsure, that's a great starting point. All right, and I think with that, I will take questions. Before we start getting into questions, I did just want to let everybody know I've dropped two links in our actual thing for um, the spot on calibrator and for the water, water sensitive paper. So the spot on spray calibrators are only about $115. That's really cheap for something you can use over and over and over again, especially for something that can really be important for whether or not you're actually <laughs> applying your stuff in a way that matters. So I highly recommend looking into those. The water sensitive paper, I also put the, that in there. This is for the more expensive T-Jet brand. And these pieces are usually about 20 inches long, or in this case, I think it's a three by two. So we actually would cut those down into one by one inch squares. So for every one square you get in the package, you end up getting six. So you can spread this out over multiple vineyards, multiple blocks, multiple years, if you keep this in a dry, unlit place. Um, again, it's about 100 bucks for 50 of them, but that's going to last you a long time. And it's a very small investment for making sure that your um, nozzles work really well. One of my favorite examples of this, actually, she didn't include this one in this, this specific one. She was helping them do some nozzle checks and she pulled off the nozzle and there was a whole hornet inside just right a whole hornet. Just, just friends just right there that guy that one yep. right there that was um, real that was pulled off a sprayer it literally looked like that when we pulled it off yep and uh I one of our mutual of friends had an entire season where they were having a huge banding issue in their vineyard and it came down to they just hadn't changed their nozzle. They thought they had, and they hadn't. And the only way they picked it out was they ran some water sensitive paper in their vineyards and it fixed everything. But and your nozzle right. can clog. So that's another reason to check your nozzle. So not only can it can you overspray, you can underspray because you have a wasp in it or you have a clump or something. So it's always good to check your nozzles. So anybody have any questions? Feel free to just turn on your camera or um, at this point, just come speak up. There's only a couple of us in here. Um, I guess not. Uh, this is kind of my time to pitch for you guys <laughs> a chance to kind of pay attention and see if we actually can do some of these sprayer calibration workshops. If you are interested in a sprayer calibration workshop, please email me. 
I will use that as a reason to help me get some money to make sure we can actually get Dr. Uh, to get Gwen Hohezel out here. She is interested. I just need to remind her. And um, she has a lot of really fun toys and a lot of ways to teach us how to do these sprayer calibrations in a cheap way. So you mm -hmm. don't have to have any fancy machines or these big boards where you drop water all into it and all that stuff. There are cheap ways to calibrate your sprayer. And that's what we need. We need to make sure we're doing this regularly. I mean, M Margaret was nice and said, do it once a year. Technically, you're supposed to also do it anytime you move the sprayer from block to block. Like, yep you're supposed to calibrate all the time <laughs> yeah. based so, on it's all based on row row width and planting density and all kinds of stuff so if you're going in between peaches going between peaches and wine grapes vastly different crops um that's you have to you have to know the setting for each of those blocks which is a real pain <laughs> and i know that and i i, I am sorry <laughs> I mean, you, you what, you actually had like marks on the side of your sprayer at one yeah. point to, to show where to which one to turn off at what time yeah. of year. And yeah. It was just in like marker. Mm -hmm. And once you get to know your sprayer and how your canopy grows, be it tree, be it vine, whatever crop you're growing, you will learn that, oh, this is typically, you know, when it gets to be this type of canopy I need this many nozzles on or I never use the nozzle below here in this block because it it's you know trained at a different height like there's all kinds of things that go into it and so if you're going under it obviously not helpful because you're spraying the ground or you're going over it but you'll learn as you as you work with your sprayer that you can just literally kind of autopilot what kind of nozzle placement you want and then you're just changing them every year like it's it's great it's easy it's it's upfront work to make your life yeah. easier for the next like life of your sprayer. So yeah, sure. I think this is part of what she was talking with about spending a little bit of money up front and then saving yourself a bunch of money down the line because sprayer operators cost money. It yeah. costs money. So it's always good if you can have someone who knows what they're doing with your sprayer and can make your life easier down the line. Mm -hmm. But anyway. Thank you guys for attending. This has been awesome. I hope you guys learned something and I'm working on actually posting these webinars in a way that anyone can access them for the life of the video. And hopefully I will see you all in our next session on the 13th for food safety. So see everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. I guess. Sorry, I got. I need to talk to Margaret after this. That's why we're hanging out. There you go. Muted. You're muted. Oh, still, still recording. <laughs>